Well, a warm welcome to today's talk. It's Tuesday, the 1st of June. Now, um, there's no secret that I think vaccination is important, but I also think therapeutics are important. And that, that's been sadly lacking in this pandemic. So what I want to do today is have a look at a potential therapeutic called ivermectin. And we've looked at it before and we know there's a lot of evidence that suggests it's a good idea in COVID-19 and possibly as an antiviral for other illnesses as well. But um, given the lack of randomised double-blind controlled trials that we'd like to see on this and the likelihood that they're not going to be done because it's not a new drug, um, we're going to look at some community-based studies. Now, there's some community-based studies. One's in Mexico City, one's in Peru, and the third one is in Uttar Pradesh. So let's look at those now and see if it develops our thinking on this on this topic. Now, this is... Um, Ivermectin and the odds of hospitalisation due to COVID-19. Evidence from a quasi-experimental analysis based on public interventions in Mexico City. Now, they call this quasi-experimental. Quasi-experimental means um, sort of experimental, but it'll miss, it won't have one of the components. And this doesn't have randomisation. So, that, so that's a pity. But of course, it's a community-based study, so it really would be pretty impossible to randomise it anyway. Um, as we'll see, there's a lot of data presented. So it's, I would say it's more of a case study, really. Policy intervention in Mexico City. Um, now, um, increased uh, increasing COVID-19 cases and with critical levels of hospital saturation during December 2020. So this was the worst time, you might remember, in, 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 uh, in Mexico, December 2020 and into January 2021. And at that time, Mexico City government decided to expand population-based healthcare interventions. Uh, implementation of a pre-hospital home care programme. So what they did was um, when people were diagnosed or people became ill, they, in, they uh, implemented a home care package, hoping to prevent them going into hospital. So implemented a, a pre-hospital home care program combining early detection with antigen tests now for early detection throughout mexico city okay it's a big city but they had 230 mobile testing kiosks where they were doing antigen tests and pcr tests so they actually carried out pretty extensive testing and it was an organized system in mexico city quite quite a quite a successful program really and when people were diagnosed positive, there was phone-based follow-up for positive patients. And this is quite good these days because most people, even people on very limited incomes, have usually got mobile phones. So this is much more possible than it used to be in the past. Since 28th of December 2020, medical ivermectin kits have been provided to positive, mild and moderate symptomatic patients. So ivermectin was the mainstay of the kits. And if people diagnosed in these 230 kiosks were, were, became positive, they were sent one of these ivermectin kits. Um, well, most of them were. So, some weren't, on, um, unfortunately, for them, but um, they, they, were, they were sent out these kits. It's a good idea to prevent hospitalizations. And these were people who were positive with mild mild to moderate uh, symptoms of COVID-19. So these are patients that are definitively diagnosed. Now, there's quite a lot of um, monitoring and surveillance of these patients. So, for example, they had quite a few red flag symptoms, which is good. So if people became uh, dyspneic, which is very short of breath, chest pain or sinus, or other things, they were referred to hospital. But the kit contained uh, aspirin, paracetamol and uh, ivermectin. And it contained four six milligram tablets Two pills for two days. So that's a 12 milligram dose, isn't it? For two days. Now, <clears throat> that's actually by the current uh, FLCCC uh, recommendations, quite a low dose, quite a low adult dose. But that's what it was, 12 milligrams for two days. So they were giving a small dose, what, what, what many people would consider a small dose of ivermectin. I think the current FLCCC protocol is about 80 milligrams for seven days for adults, but don't take my word for that. We'll, we'll, um, in fact, don't take any medicines based on what I say, of course. But anyway, that is the low dose. That's the point I'm making. That is a fairly low dose, 12 milligrams for two days. Um, now, um, after, one, after one month, they delivered 83,000 medical kits. So 
not a bad number. You can get quite a lot of information from that. Detailed data was collected on the evolution of the patient illness. This was done well. Quasi-experimental evaluation of the effect of medication kits on hospitalisation was carried out. Uh, so now, to, to, have a, to have an experiment, what you need, or, or a, a trial, is three components. You need, you need an intervention group who actually gets the drug. You need a control group who doesn't get the drug or gets a placebo. And allocation to those groups should be randomised. So it's quasi-experimental because you've got the experimental group that got the drug and you've got the control group that didn't get the drug. Now, the people that didn't get the drug were partly made up from people who became ill before the, the uh, home uh, medicine kit was implemented or people that for various administrative reasons didn't end up getting the kit during the rollout. So what they ended up was one group called kit receivers who got the drug. That's the intervention group or the experimental group. And the other group was the non kit receivers that didn't get the drug. They were the control group so we've got two groups to compare and contrast so that's good so it, it is actually yeah it is quasi-experimental that it's just that the allocation to the two groups was not randomized but it was large numbers so they're able to do matched observations and they adjusted for sex age COVID severity and <clears throat> and comorbidities so they took account of a lot of factors and to tell you the truth they did quite a lot of um, statistical techniques on this to account for various things and I don't pretend to understand all the statistics but it, it reading through it it, it was a it, it read well it seemed like these people really knew what they were talking about now they ended up with a hundred and uh, hundred fifty six thousand four hundred eight four hundred and sixty eight patients with COVID-19 infections before implementation of the ivermectin program so that was a pretty big control group really <laughs> and the experimental group um uh, 77,000 were there after implementation. Now, not all of those got the kits, but a substantial number did. So basically, we've got um, a pretty large control group who were non-kit receivers and a pretty large group of kit receivers as well to compare and contrast. So comparing the kit receivers and non-kit receivers, that number with that number. And if you know anything about statistics at all, you'll see that these are really excellent numbers. You can get some highly valid statistics out of numbers are this high. Uh, outcome variables, whether or not the patient was hospitalised, that's what they were looking at. Did this patient end up in hospital or not? Because the aim was to prevent deterioration. And, and, and of course, we were talking to uh, our, our, our Dr. Pravin uh, Nair in India, and he gives uh, ivermectin at the early stages, and he believes that prevents a lot of hospitalizations and deterioration he says it's definitely uh, effective but what were the results in Mexico City um, so negative and significant effects of the ivermectin based medical kit on the probability of hospitalization in other words the people that got the hospital kits were less likely to be the, the people that got the pre-hospital kits with the ivermectin were less likely to be hospitalized it was being protective and the effective range was 50 to 76 percent. So some groupings were 50 percent less likely to be hospitalized. Other groupings were 76 percent less likely to be hospitalized. And remember, this is just on 12 milligrams for two days. Had a larger dose been given, I would expect the protective effect to be greater. So that's on a small dose. Difference in hospitalization, odds between treated and non-patients treated and untreated patients. So um, treated patients with ivermectin, untreated patients without ivermectin, statistically significant in all cases. So this was statistically significant. They did not believe this was an artifact of the data. They did the stats and they found them to be significant. And I think this is a significant finding. Um, as expected, the effects of the medical kits is higher and stronger, of course, amongst uh, males, older patients, and uh, in case uh, in cases with severe symptoms. So, um, the ivermectin was doing more good in people with greater risk factors. But of course, these are the people more likely to be admitted to hospital anyway: uh, men, older older patients, and uh, increasingly severe illness, as you would expect. So discussions and limitations, they're quite frank about this. Of course, I put the link in um, 
go to the paper, re read it for yourself. Now, this is a preprint. Um, it is a preprint. It hasn't been peer reviewed yet, but it does seem pretty well written. Um, <clears throat> we found that the medical kit given en masse to patients who tested positive in Mexico City had a negative, significant and robust effect on the odds of being hospitalised. So they were less likely to be hospitalised. This effect was significant and it was a robust effect. Independently of the medical uh, telephone follow-up, level of hospitalisation, occupancy and period of time. So they did take in, they took a lot of factors into account. So um, how well people were followed up, of course, that should reduce their hospitalisations. How full the hospitals were, because if the hospitals are very full, <coughs> then... then um, if the hospitals are very full, then very often you would need to have to be sicker to, to get in. So they accounted for that and they accounted for the time period as well. And they accounted for quite a few other variables as well. And they reported a similar trend to a study done in Peru. Now, um, they did, this study did not analyse the mode of action. But in the study, they believe, they said they believe that the principal mechanism uh, principal mechanism, reduction in viral load in the patients that take ivermectin in the early stages of the disease. So in the early stages of the disease, what they believe is the ivermectin reduced the viral load. That made the patients less sick. And because the viral load was less, they had less inflammatory reaction to the virus. Therefore, they had less severe COVID complications. But of course, you don't need me to tell you that if it reduced the viral load, that would also reduce transmissibility because viral load is one of the factors in transmissibility. So we will believe, if this is true, that it reduced viral load, as the authors believed, we will believe that this, as well as preventing the hospitalizations and deterioration, would also have prevented some degree of transmission. How much? We don't know. The study wasn't designed to say that. But it would make sense, biologically, that it would reduce transmission. So uh, moving, moving on to this study in Peru uh, that they mentioned, again, the link's there, click on it, it's there, download the paper. There's 25 states in Peru, different states in Peru had different levels of uh, uh, ivermectin therapy. Um, so they were grouped by the extent of ivermectin distribution. So some people, some states used it a lot, some patients, states used it not very much. They divided them into maximum, medium and minimal. And then they looked at the reduction in excess deaths 30 days after the peak. So they, they took the time when there was the peak deaths. Then they looked at how much the deaths declined over 30 days. So that could give them a percentage. So it was deaths after a particular period of time. Now, they, those areas where there was maximal use of ivermectin, the deaths went down by 74% after the peak in uh, 30 days. The median, it was 53% after 30 days. And the minimal states that used it, the death rate went down 25% after the peak. So again, pretty uh, interesting sequence of increasing uh, reductions. The more ivermectin used in a state, the greater the uh, the greater reduction in deaths. Now again, these are community studies. It's not definitive proof, but it is uh, pretty interesting and consistent. Reduction of excess deaths is correlated with extent of ivermectin distribution by state, and that is highly significant. So the p-value there is 0 0.002. So that is a very highly significant result. It means the probability of the result arising by chance is um, uh, not one in ten, not one in it's two in a thousand, isn't it? That the result arose by chance. So a very significant result. We would accept that. And the authors say they strongly suggest that ivermectin treatment can likewise effectively complement immunisation to help eradicate COVID-19. Now, I can't stress how much I agree with this statement. It is ridiculous and indeed a bit upsetting, really, that people that support therapeutics like ivermectin sometimes, not, not always, of course, but sometimes aren't so keen on vaccinations and people that are very pro-vaccine think the therapeutics are irrelevant but if the therapeutics can stop people getting hospitalized stop people getting sick stop people dying then 
who's going to disagree with that? And uh, if the therapeutics reduce viral load and reduce transmission, then while we're waiting for these populations to be vaccinated, if it reduces transmission safely, then why wouldn't you want to implement that? Um, now, the Peru authors also said uh, the indicated biological mechanism of ivermectin. Now, they're saying it's some competitive binding with sars coronavirus 2 spike protein. So presumably what's happening is the ivermectin is... If, if, if that if that's the uh, if that's the ACE two receptor where the spike protein tries to get into, then presumably what's happening is the ivermectin is like clogging clogging up the receptor so the spike protein can't get in. It's it's called competitive blockade in pharmacology. I think that's what the, the I think that's what they're belie believing the me mechanism of action is in this case, although there are various mechanisms of action of ivermectin we believe, um, but it's likely to be non epitope specific. Now the epitope. An epitope is the an epitope is the part of the antigen, the part of the virus or the bacteria, in this case the virus, that the immune system recognises as being foreign. And of course it's the epitope, particularly on the spike protein, which is changed in the variant, the Brazilian variant, the uh, UK variant, the uh, India variant, the, um, the, the Vietnamese variant. It's the epitope that's changed. But because the mechanism of action they believe is that the ivermectin is clogging up the um, receptor site, it doesn't matter too much what configuration this has, whether it's got a mutation there or there or there or there. It doesn't matter too much because it will still be obstructed from binding because this is acting on the receptor site. Not so. so this should work against all the different variants is what they're saying, which of course is remarkably... Um, remarkably encouraging so possibly yielding full efficiency against emerging viral mutant strains is what they are saying now um, of course we know that ivermectin has been used in india extensively uh, Uttar pradesh and goa for example um, but no, there's not really any papers from that at the moment but so what i've got here is this is just an article from the um from the uh in, uh, India Express, a big newspaper in India. Uh, people talking from the Uttar Pradesh government claim to be the first to have introduced large-scale prophylactic and therapeutic use of ivermectin. Notice that they're claiming prophylactic because it reduces viral load, therefore it prevents the spread. And therapeutic, it's both. Um, and they, the, the estate officials, as reported in the newspaper, are saying help to... S help the state to maintain lower fatality and positivity rates compared to other states. Health department introduced ivermectin for prophylaxis for close contact of patients way back on the 6th of August 2020. So they probably were one of the early ones. And of course, Uttar Pradesh is, uh, from memory, the most populated state in India. I think it's 220 million people. Massively populated state. Um, so in Agra, um, this doctor and the state surveillance officer uh, administered ivermectin to all um, RRT team members. Oh, what does that stand for? I can't remember. But anyway, it, it's a ra rapid reaction team. That's it. So it's the people that go out and see the patients as soon as they're ill. Rapid reaction team. It's not an abbreviation we really use in, in the UK. Uh, so basically, they had these rapid reaction teams. And they were going out seeing the patients who were newly diagnosed. And of course, the patients that are newly diagnosed are most infectious at that stage on the first day of their symptoms. So they used ivermectin prophylaxis in these rapid reaction teams. And in Agra state or Agra district of Uttar Pradesh state, none, none of the members of that the rapid reaction team got, uh, got COVID. There were, none of them were diagnosed with COVID, despite being in daily contact with patients who presumably had their highest possible viral load. Direct quote from the surveillance officer, despite being the state with the largest population based on a high population density, very high population density, very crowded living accommodation very often, we have maintained a relatively low positivity rate and the case per million of the population, so that's good. Uh, lower positivity and fatality rates may be attributed to the large scale scale of ivermectin use in Uttar Pradesh, they believe. 
and it looks like there's similar positive uh, rumblings coming out from the government of Goa as well. Now, th these doctors in Uttar Pradesh say they will write a paper, um, so we are expecting something fairly definitive, uh, definitive on that in the next few months. So where does this leave us? Well, we've done interviews with world-leading medical authorities on this channel. Uh, we've looked at quite a lot of other evidence and trials, not least from India and the India research, the Indian Medical Research Institute. I can't remember what it's called, but who recommend ivermectin. And uh, we've looked at a lot of evidence and it does seem to be indicating that ivermectin is efficacious in the prophylaxis and treatment of COVID-19. Right now, having said that, don't take any treatments based on what I say. Always go to your own doctor. If you want to be treated in that particular way, just go and ask your doctor and see if he'll prescribe it for you. Um, but really, the question has to be asked. In fact, I ask it now to Sir Patrick Valance and Sir Chris Whitty, Dr. Chris Whitty in, in my country. Will you answer this question? You should comment on ivermectin, really. I really think you should. If it's to say, look, ivermectin is completely useless, under no circumstances use it, fine. Say, say that. But this deafening silence, so much evidence has been presented, and yet the silence is completely deafening. We just don't hear anything about it. Or in the mainstream media, why, why is there such um, a lot of silence about this? I'm not providing answers to that question. I'm, I'm asking it. Given this evidence that we've looked at today and other evidence, I would have thought, I would have thought that the World Health Organization might, might want to revisit and reconsider its recommendations. I would have thought, but what do I know? All we do is look at the evidence and try and process the evidence. So hopefully more community-based work on that coming out soon. In the meantime, it's interesting and um, we really have to wonder why we are hearing so little from health authorities in, in other parts of the world that aren't, uh, aren't taking an interest in, in this uh, particular therapeutic topic. Okay, um, thank you for watching. I oh, know, I was gonna show you some trivia. I'm gonna show you some trivia. It is trivia, so I'm, I'm sorry. Right, thank you for watching, I'm finished now. <laughs> but um, if you're vaguely interested, I've just put a few things on the screen that I thought you might be interested in. Um, it's just trivia, really, but this is the age profile of people that watch uh, these videos. So, very few 13 to 17 year olds watching, and 18 to 24, so with increasing age, increasing viewership. So, what do we make of that? You tell me, I don't really know, but it's uh, interesting. That is from YouTube Analytics uh, today. Um, Male female distribution of viewers. Interesting, quite a lot more males than females watch. So, interesting. Um, perhaps uh, women are watching using men's accounts, I don't know. But interesting, interesting data. And uh, these, these are the countries where we are most watched. Now, this is the number of views in the past uh, 28 days. So United States, United Kingdom, Canada, India, Australia, Ireland, Philippines, South Africa, Germany, Netherlands, Sweden, Malaysia, New Zealand, Singapore, France, Thailand, Spain, Kenya, in that order. Pakistan, Norway, Trinidad and Tobago, Finland, Denmark, Switzerland, Brazil, Italy, Belgium, Indonesia, Nigeria, Zambia, Poland, Romania, United Arab Emirates, Japan, Mexico City, Hong Kong. So, so you probably dropped off to sleep now or turn this video off. But I, I thought it was interesting and... and just on a personal note, I actually genuinely find it quite, quite, quite humbling, really, that people watch from so many, so many different countries. It really is um, quite amazing. I started making educational videos in, uh, um, well, I can't remember actually. I, th I think it was probably 1991. It could have even, it could have 1991 or 1992 with the big old fashioned VHS camera. And uh, the idea that you could have streamed a video on those days was just beyond imagination and beyond the technology. So, um, in in uh, just in one working lifetime, really, the situation has been transformed, and it's quite amazing. If you're young, you probably don't quite appreciate that, but to me, it's amazing. Anyway, I go on too much, so thank you for watching.